So as we're looking at the training continuum and what the roles that um, residents are playing in kind of shaping the culture of Michigan and the things that we're doing, um, I always reflected upon the reasons that brought me here and how my interest has always been focused on how we can make the dream of becoming a surgeon available to everybody. Um, not just the students that traditionally have been able to access the opportunities and the resources that put you in the position to be able to make an ask for, uh, for a place like ours and just for the specialty in general. So with this in mind, I partnered with a talented group of Michigan medical students to create leagues, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, which is our first preclinical pre pipeline program here at Michigan Surgery. Um, so many of you might be familiar with the concept of the leaky training pipeline of medicine where students from at-risk backgrounds are falling off the educational continuum as early as kindergarten, which is limiting the talent pool of medicine as a whole and also of surgical specialties like ours. And some of these leaky joints that you see in this slide uh, correspond to issues that many of you might be familiar with, such as lack of family financial resources, adequate mentorship, and then the effects of systemic racism on any, everything from undergraduate to medical training to residency. And so with this in mind, we developed the Leeds Fellowship as a novel surgical pipeline program. I was inspired by being uh, the beneficiary of a lot of pipeline programs that have brought me here um, to Michigan Surgery. And this program aims to develop future surgeon leaders who are invested in diversity, equity, and inclusion for patients and students and also the rest of professionals that work with us in academic surgery. Um, our program aimed to accomplish this through like a three-angle approach, mentorship, uh, academic support and research opportunities, and clinical experience. And so we created this four-week uh, fellowship program uh, that included six core components that you can see in the slide here, from recruitment to interviewing, uh, participating, our participating fellows, um, seminars and workshops, research, and then surgical skills and community building. And as you're hearing all of these kind of elements, it's like, oh, these are all the ingredients of the soup. And let me tell you, some people don't have some of this, even after they have made it to medical school, even after you're at the point in which like everybody should be in a level playing field, the field is never leveled. Um, we advertise for this program over social media. Um, we use our contacts with national underrepresented in medicine student groups and recruited rising second year medical students to participate over the summer between their M1 and M2 years. Um, everybody has a different curriculum now, but in a traditional curriculum, that's like your last summer of medical school. Some of you might have one, I had one. Um, and I didn't have money to pay for rent that summer. So it's really hard to engage in research when you're also trying to, to pay the bills. Uh, so our application collected some basic demographic information and it consisted of uh, the three short response questions aimed at trying to assess the student's interest in surgery, whether they were interested in research, research was not required, um, and whether or not they had a commitment, a demonstrated commitment to diversity um, on provider teams and equitable healthcare. We received many applications uh, and it was a joy to read them. They came from all over the US and Puerto Rico and three applicants from an outstanding pool were selected to participate uh, on our pilot program, which just happened um, this summer. And we had originally intended for this to be like when I came to research, so I'm in my first year of research, and I was going to come out and we we're going to implement this program, and I was going to be able to take the students to the operating room, and then COVID happened. And so what we had originally intended to be an in-person uh, research fellowship, um, and we laid all the foundation for this, ended up becoming a virtual opportunity. Um, and there was a point in which we needed to decide whether or not um, the program was going to be worth it, but we felt that with the COVID pandemic, leagues was even like needed even more because so many students had been impacted uh, with cancel oper in-person opportunities. Um, and so we moved right along. Um, and this took a lot of work, um, and I did not do this alone. So we moved forward with converting the entire program to virtual. Uh, this is a screenshot of my elaborate Google Calendar uh, for one of our fellows. And in many ways, the, the virtual uh, format made it simpler to schedule some of the, uh, like the mentorship components, the Zoom meetings. Uh, you're seeing the snapshot here, and there, is, uh, there are things that were happening every single day. And we found it very important to provide, um, uh, to figure out a way to provide a stipend for our fellows, even though with COVID-19, the fund situation changed. 
like I mentioned earlier, and many of you might know, when you when you don't have any financial aid during that summertime, and so if somebody is going to be able to take advantage of a research opportunity or an like overseas tree, all of these things that like make you a good applicant, um, not having funds, not being able to afford that, like creates a disparity in what those uh, on those access to those opportunities. Um, so we actually received a very generous private gift and we were able to provide our fellows with a stipend to cover their effort instead of asking them for them to participate um, uh, for free, which we felt very strongly was going to increase the equity of access to the opportunity. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure the fellows' engagement with the program reflected their interest um, and they, we performed an incoming interview for the three of them to try to see where they were coming from, like what were they hoping to get. A lot of them had no experience with research. They didn't have a home surgery requirement. They didn't know what they wanted to do. And this was an opportunity as much for them to benefit as for us to be able to open the doors of our specialty to them. We found that fellows unanimously had a strong interest in the surgical specialty and surgery as a specialty and a desire to have a career working with minority patients and improving representation in academic medicine. Um, this was a large motivation for them to actually participate in leagues. And our fellows also came in, as I said, with very little, little research experience or surgical mentorship. And they were worried about pursuing a surgical career, given both how competitive it is and also the stereotype of a hostile surgical culture with high rates of burnout across the country. Um, they also had a perception that success in surgery was dependent on networking and being well connected. And so if you happen to be, maybe you got into medical school, but maybe you don't have a surgery department or maybe people at your surgery department don't do research. And so it can be very challenging for students to kind of network their way in. Um, so what did we do during this month? Uh, the program ran this past July. So I finished, I did my last emergency case on June 29. And then on July 1st, we had our first session for leagues. Um, the program um, ran with, we couldn't have run without the support of, of our Michigan family. So there were over 30 Michigan faculty and residents uh, that participated uh, in the program. Each week, the fellows attended lectures, workshops uh, that were conducted by our faculty and residents, and also our senior medical students, as this program was completely run by, by our senior medical students who may be applying with you guys this season. Um, there was a heavy component of peer mentorship and then also uh, focus on, get, on how to get involved in advocacy as a trainee for these uh, students that have like a strong interest in social justice, like trying to figure out a way in which you can balance a basic career as a surgeon, a researcher, and also an activist, like seems like an impossible thing. So we had some sessions um, designed to teach them about that. Um, the lecture portion of the sessions were recorded and then we shared them on our department's YouTube channel, which was one of the unforeseen benefits of actually going virtual was that we were able to actually increase the footprint of the content um, in, in a time in which a lot of students were looking for additional opportunities. Um, we really want to make sure that the fellows were engaged in the research. As you guys know better than anybody, academic productivity has become a, like a desired currency for um, residency applications. Um, and so making sure that we open opportunities for them to be able to be academically active were, was very important. And it was a hefty goal to be able to do this in four weeks. However, our, we were able to identify faculty mentors um, that have projects that were able to be conducted remotely and within the time frame of the fellowship. And we had a really excellent experience. And here are our uh, three uh, faculty members for our pilot year that include Dr. Inglesby, who talked today. Uh, one of the components that had the biggest twist was that we were hoping to actually introduce you to surgery, which you know, taking care of patients in the uh, outside of the operating room is half of what, I, of what we do. And then but the OR uh, is a big part of our lives and learning about like learning to suture and, and having an introduction to the procedural aspect of surgery was important. Um, but our uh, two of our uh, medical student leaders, uh, Jessica and Kelly Santos Parker, actually figure out a way of teaching our students how to suture over Zoom. And so we created this uh, care packages with the appropriate materials. And then we had, um, we had sessions uh, that we conducted remotely, which was actually pretty awesome and something that has paid off uh, in a number of ways. Um, one important part that we didn't wanna lose with having to do this virtually was building a sense of community um, for the students. And so to achieve this, the leadership of leagues, um, we, we had like time in between seminars in which we socialized with students but also dedicated uh, time outside of the seminars in which we do that as well.
And um, four weeks, again, seems like a short time, but this is a sample of the projects that our scholars were able, able to complete under four weeks things with us at leagues. Um, they were like solid, amazing projects that I was incredibly proud to, see, proud to see them completed. And in terms of deliverables, all of them submitted abstracts uh, for one of our larger surgical conferences, and two of them are currently working on manuscripts. I actually just finished reviewing one of them um, and it's getting very close. And this is for a student that had no previous experience doing the research. Um, one, of, one of the most important part for us was to capture the impact of the, that the program had on the fellows. So the next couple of slides just have a couple of quotes. Uh, we conducted some post interviews after the program and overwhelmingly all of them felt like they get gaining valuable research experience, um, but also a sense of community and what a feeling of what surgery was really about. Um, they also gained a new perspective on the type of research that was being done, performed by surgeons uh, and that health services research and disparities research is being done by surgeons. Um, and so it was very special for us to see that that had, like, that had been communicated through the program. And as far as like the, the kind of phenotype of student that we were able to benefit, to, uh, a benefit with the program, two of our fellows didn't have a home surgical department. As I mentioned, they didn't have any research experience. And then many fellows were originally very hesitant about like the perceived culture of surgery um, and the um, like the issues that might arise when you're even considering it, like discounting it before you even think about it. So seeing that their perspectives around it had already changed in the short term was very meaningful. Uh, one goal of leaks was to be able to create a lineage of mentors. So we had um, we are going to be having our second um, our second installment of leaks next year. And uh, the students like demonstrate a lot of interest and actually participated in taking back what they had learned to their institution. And all of this sounds awesome, but none of this was easy. And uh, it was actually incredibly challenging and we had to troubleshoot a lot. And in some ways we're like, oh, we did this, we did this, and these are what, what the students got. But like our institution and like the faculty and the residents uh, gained a lot. And I gained a lot of experience both putting a program like this together and then the residents and faculty and the students, because we had a lot of students involved, mentoring across geographical barriers and then seeing what it actually takes to do like this type of diversity work. And so as we're looking into the future, uh, we're getting ready, getting ready for 2021 uh, and things are gonna be hard. We don't know if we're gonna be in person, we're working on long-term long funding and then uh, making sure that we don't overutilize like the key resource of this program, which is the time and energy of our faculty and residents. Um, but we're excited for it. And this is a great opportunity. I'm hoping that it becomes an opportunity in which residents and students here at Michigan Surgery are able to participate in really meaningful uh, diversity pipeline work.